Jennifer. I'm an independent journalist and filmmaker. And I recently made a short documentary about the plight of the local abattoir in the UK, which we will screen shortly. Um, after which we will have a panel discussion with William Lloyd Williams, who is the subject of the film. Um, so he's been batting to keep his local meat purveyor business in McCunthleth, Mid Wales, open for 40 years. Um, so businesses like his are now few and far between. Um, and there's been a 99% decrease in local abattoirs um, since the 1930s, uh, which is a fairly shocking statistic. Um, and we'll be exploring why that is later in the session. Um, also with us is Phil Brook from Compassion and World Farming. Um, he works to develop the animal welfare knowledge base in the Compassion Research Department. Um, he was a science teacher for 20 years and has now worked for Compassion for over two decades. Um, and he also works on the development of a website called Fish Count, which addresses the welfare of fish caught in commercial fishing. Um, so he'd be, he'll be able to talk to, you know, why local abattoirs are so much better for animal welfare, among other things. Um, and finally, we have Rodri Lloyd-Williams, who is not a relation of Will. Um, and he is a Welsh mountain lamb farmer in Talibont, Mid Wales. Um, his farm offers meat box schemes and he uses Will Lloyd's abattoir for his kills. Um, and he's been farming for 14 years and has a degree in animal science with honors in wildlife biology. Um, and his farm is fully organically certifi certified and has been since 1999 and mostly runs off a hydro scheme. Um, so yeah, after the panel discussion, we'll open out to, to you guys um, to a Q&A with everyone attending. So please post your questions in the chat as and when you think of them and we will collate them all and get to them at the end. Um, and thank you, I see you've already started posting um, where you're from, who you are, and uh, and why you're interested in this topic. So thank you. Great to see. Great to see you all. Um, so without further ado, here is the film which um, I shot this summer and was released a few weeks ago, um, called Swan Song of the Local Abattoir. So thanks, Nina, if you could play that now. A Roman guy, Plutarch, what did he say? Let us eat flesh for food, not for greed and wantonness. The abattoir is 500 yards away from the shop, and I bring cattle to be slaughtered. You're looking at 140, 147 steps, I think it is, from there to here, so when people talk about a carbon footprint, I don't know how small a carbon footprint they want. In the 1930s, we had 30,000 small abattoirs in the UK. We're down to under 250 now. That's frightening. Getting addicted to them Black Mountain grills, eh? They're pretty good, aren't they, eh? You're lucky we've got dill on them this week. It's been marijuana the last fortnight, but the dill makes a difference. <laughs> the business has been in the family, as I say, for since the 50s. And that time they did have shops in Tawin, Abu Dhabi, Corris, and Machantla. Of course, the abattoir as well. And, uh, well, everybody ate meat then. I, I don't think there was... The word vegan was in the dictionary then. I don't think it was. Supermarkets opened, uh, smaller communities, they lost their, you know, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. Things got more centralised and in the end, the other shops went and we stuck with this one. I do shop at the supermarket, but um, I like to support Will and I've known him almost since he was a little boy. I do believe in the local abattoir. I think this one is important because um, Will has got a field and so the animals have no stress and I think that that is very important from the point of view of the animal 
I, I, th I feel very strongly about this abattoir that uh, is kind to the animals and provides good meat for local people. And I think um, Will is much appreciated. I mean, his sense of humor is also appreciated. <laughs> An old, old abattoir guy made this. He said, I know what you want. He likes, he likes coming here because you fought them, Will. You fought them and you've beaten them. They've had to retire before they can say anything to you. And I'm, I'm a little bit catty when I go to livestock shows and I see some of these people. Oh, William, how are you? Well, I'm still alive, no thanks to you. I said you tried your best to bloody close me and finish my family and my living, but there we are. Do we am I as David Yohan says. You tell him to come himself, not to send a messenger. I deal, tell him I only deal with the chiefs, not the Indians. Yeah, yeah well, tell him I. Certainly not the chief. Well, he tells me he is. The average age of an abattoir owner is 68. That's not helpful for succession planning. Uh, hopefully, what's happened this last four months, it let a few people and they'll, they'll understand the importance of the tag local food and of course, to have a tag local meat, you need an abattoir. You say this place was dirty? You know, what's wrong with it? Why are they trying to close places like this? Why is there an emphasis on it, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, if you come to here, you'll see then that uh, the larages around the back the sheep and the pigs are stunned there. They come out in a line. They're bled in there. So that part of the operation, nobody sees only the vet and the operator, which is important to me. As you can see, I've put cameras in, which I'm not happy about. It used to be you, you're innocent till you've proven guilty. I feel here I'm guilty and I've got to prove my innocence. And to think that my way of Procuring animals to meat is the most sensible one and welfare friendly one, and yet I'm still looked at uh, uh, as a villain. Someone that has to kill animals to do with his living, you wouldn't think that this guy is a slaughterman because of the way that he namby pambies his animals. Good girls, eh? Good girls. Well, I farm Ooh. about 10 miles up the road, uh, 350 acres or so. I use Will down here because he's only 10 miles away. And the less distance you have from a farm to an abattoir, the better the animal kills. You know, where else can I take it? Once these small abattoirs have closed, I don't know what's going to happen. It'll be a dark day. When the shutters come down here, it'll be a dark day, and people will say, well, do you know what? God, I miss Will Lloyds. You know, I, I mean, we can't get the quality, and we've got to go further away. And, well, you know, it's... It's just like Friday afternoon, we'd go in there and we'd have a chat and we'd know football was on and it'll have gone. And it, it'll be a massive part of the town. It will. Great, thank you, and um, I hope you uh, hope you enjoyed that, and um, that it gave some insight into 
to why a business like Wills is, is so important to, to not only the farmers, but also, you know, the local economy. Um, so I want to start with, with Will. Um, so, Will, you're the only remaining abattoir, small abattoir in the area. Um, maybe you can tell us why you think you've managed to survive for so long where everyone else has had to close. Um, I think the biggest thing was uh, my age because we had the red meat package, a document that came out that was going to be forced from Europe in the late 70s, early 80s. We had seven small abattoirs. And of course, as I've mentioned in the film, the average age is uh, 68 now. I think it could have been 78 then. Uh, I was the youngest one. Uh, I didn't think this individual from the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food with his clipboard and his little notepad, I didn't think that he had the right to threaten closure to a well-run, long-established business. And I was 17, 18 years of age. I was dangerous then. Uh, light blue touch paper stand five paces clear. But, uh, you know, I mean, as I've said there, I'm still here. I've abided by the rules. And I think what people should do, the authorities, they should say, their tack should be, how the hell are you still here? Because you shouldn't be here. We've thrown everything at you. Rules, regulations, and also you've had foot to mouth, BSE, you've had all these to contend with, you're still here. They should be asking the ones that are left, how are you here? Why are you here? And they should be able then to work it so that we get more of them. We don't, we don't want buckets full of money chucked at us. What we want is fair play so that the new younger generation can see that there's a profitable livelihood to be had from being a local abattoir. Yeah, and of course, we mentioned it in the, in the film also that um, I mentioned earlier as well, that there's been such a, a steep decline in local abattoirs. Maybe you can just explain to people who don't know why that is briefly, why there has been such a dramatic decline in the last 40, 50 years. Well, again, I think there's, there's an age thing there. There's been no succession planning. Uh, the profitability is... Of course, when you get older, that means that you can't do so much work. So you have to pay more people to come and do them, do the work. Uh, those people aren't readily available because most of the slaughtermen now are on a line, which will take 18 of them to slaughter a lamb. Whereas, you know, the old fashioned slaughterman could turn his hand from doing 40 sheep, clean down three cattle, clean down, and then do six or eight pigs. But, uh, you know, it's to do with the rules and regulations uh, are the crux because following rules and regulations means expenditure. And when they came to me, we, we did spend somewhere in the region of 275K. But you've got to realize the other six abattoir owners were in well in the 60s and 70s. If they didn't have dependents, would you invest? 250,000 in something that could possibly go pop in five years. Mm. I mean, if they had 250,000, they'd be better off putting it in the pension. And that's, that's what's happened. And um, Rod Rodri, I want to get your perspective, um, your experience using a local abattoir and what your business would look like if, if Will closed and if there was no possibility to, to access a local abattoir. Yeah, well, it all started for us really before my time. Like a lot of farmers around this area, my parents always used to take um, lambs and cows to will just for home kills, just for our, fill our freezer before winter. And so, um, yeah, like most farmers, we probably took the worst to will and, and sold the best uh, on the conventional scheme. So it always used to be the little rubbishy things and uh, used to somehow find some meat on them. But then as, as more and more people started showing interest and, and asking about lambs, we started selling to family and friends and then um a few years back we set up the welsh mountain lamb website and um yeah we just found that there was a demand people wanted to know where their food came from they wanted it to come from a local farm uh, perhaps an organic farm whether that was important or not but more that they could come and visit the farm and know what happened and so i came went to will and asked if it was you know he'd be happy to 
helped me and he was massively encouraging and massively helpful and and you know dealt he deals with the couriers i do all the local deliveries and collect from the shop and then he anything that gets couriered will deals with and yeah um if it wasn't for world if he wasn't there yeah no chance that there, there, there just wouldn't be there's nowhere else i can take them so i'm utterly reliant on having a local abattoir and as are my customers and um i think what's been interesting is um selling direct is not only is it sort of empowering for me to be able to actually name my price rather than, you know, working in the, down the conventional lines, you sort of rock up at a big abattoir and they tell you what you're getting paid that day. It's a very different mindset to be able to say, well, this is what I need to charge for this lamb because these are my costs of production. And you find people um, more, more than often willing to pay that. And also then they get a buy into the farm so they can come visit and they can see what we're doing. And they, you know, and, and if they offer an opinion and are happy with how we're, managing our land then and, and there's sort of a buy-in there's a relationship built and yeah as you say without without will and and that they were very lucky to have him you know 10 miles down the road if we didn't then i'd have to go back to the sort of quantity over quality model and sell through the big abattoirs that are all over over an hour's driveway and and how important do you think the the producer consumer relationship is it's massive yeah and it's something i was really naive about um before starting to do this um but you know we got our little facebook page and so i can show people what we're doing on farm and how we're managing the land and and i can show people the wildlife we've got on farm i think you know there's this sort of assumption that a lot of farms are dead zones and just for producing producing animals when in reality we're we're managing habitat for all kinds of wildlife and nature so you get that buy-in and you get that and, and it and it encourages you. I think as a farm, it's quite a lonely job a lot of the time. And so all of a sudden when you're you you're dealing with consumers who actually care about what you're doing, it's quite invigorating, empowering. And and um so yeah, it's been a really positive uh, experience all around, really. Um and uh getting to go and visit Will every few weeks is always a joy as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> quite the character if if you uh <laughs> didn't get that from the film. <laughs> um and obviously um, the pandemic has, has kind of emphasized and revealed if we weren't already aware how important these short supply chains are. Maybe you or Will could talk to that and, uh, and why they're so essential um, for a resilient food system. Yeah, do you wanna go Will? Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the best thing is, is that you're selling the story. I'm not just selling the meat, I'm selling the story and this is, this is the important bit. And I, I liken this to a true event that happened to explain traceability and what it means to people. We had a farmer, Tom Thomas Nantagasig. He'd been sorting new lambs out in the morning. He'd sorted some ewes out late in the morning and gone up for dinner, come back. Some walkers had gone through the farm, left the gates open and they all mixed up and he had to sort them out all again. Took him till about four or five o'clock. He wasn't best pleased, he was grumpy, but he came down to the petrol station to get some diesel for the lorry. And there was a girl that was in school with him. And I mean, Tom was in his seventies then. And she just shouted at him, Tom Thomas, smile, you miserable bugger. We had a leg of lamb from Willoyd's last week. It was from your place, it was lovely. Keep up the good work. Nice to see you, Tom. Now, from a really terrible, horrible day, Tom Thomas had got the gist that, well, look, what I'm doing, people appreciate. So there's the traceability in a nutshell. And, you know, we won, I think one of our first awards was given by the two fat ladies uh, on their little uh, sidecar and motorbike. And that's what they picked on more than anything. This guy is allowing you the phone number of the farm to ask what color it was, what age it was, what sex it was, what it's been eating, how old it is. And these are things that we do every week. It's not as if we do just for a show, but it's the story that's important. And of course, it's the shortest food chain you'll get. Farmer, Rodri, Will, the slaughterer, and the butcher, and the customer. Now, if there was a problem, if there was, easily identifiable, because it's a short food chain. 
you haven't got things going from one place 40 miles to be cut then to be packed another 40 miles then to be dispatched another 80 miles so the product finds itself going around the country um the term carbon footprint just gets lost in the diesel fumes and, and of course by doing it this way during the pandemic and lockdown we've had so many younger housewives eating good stuff that they don't want to go back to eating and doing the monthly shop in the supermarket. So, you know, uh, from something bad, there all always some good come from it. My father always used to say that. And uh, possibly people are told to eat less meat, but what they will do is they will eat a better quality meat, which is the way that we're doing it. And as an aside, they're helping to save the planet as well. Win, win, win. If only if it was so simple. I mean, do, do you think that will stick? Um, do you think that shift in, in how people are consuming food uh, over the pandemic, do you think that's going to be a long-term thing, that people will be looking to, to quality and, um, and local suppliers? If you'd have asked me that in July, June, July, I would have said yes, definitely. But since then... You know, people have started going back to the supermarket. And one of the problems is, is that the price of lamb and beef has shot up. And, you know, if it's shot up, that means that your lamb chops, your braising steak, your, you know, your lamb cowl and what have you, that goes up. Well, I can understand that the young housewife's got a budget and she can only stretch the budget like elastic band so far. So because of this, some of them can't meet it, so they have to go back to your Lidl's and Aldi's, which is a shame, but we will all await what happens on the 31st of December 2020, 1st of January 2021. And I want to, to talk now about um, the, the case for, for local abattoir in terms of um, animal welfare uh, issues. Um, and according to the FSA, most welfare problems associated with the farm to slaughterhouse chain occur in transport. Um, so Phil, perhaps you can talk, talk more to that and, uh, and why they're so vital in terms of uh, ensuring animal welfare. Oh, you just muted that. Sorry, I need to yeah, unmute no myself. Worries. I've, I've managed now. I've been beaten <laughs> by the technology. Um, tra transport is one of the big risk factors for welfare, along with slaughter. Um, and, and like for slaughter, you have to have people who are really committed to looking after the animal in the right way. Transport is one of those things that is ideally avoidable. Um, you, you've got animals that have been on the farm with people they know, suddenly transported with people they don't know, removed from their companions. Let's assume they're treated well. It's still a stressful experience. And, and the longer it is, the worse it gets. If the trans and if the treatment is less good, you get bruising and rough treatment. If you have unfit for travel animals, worse still. Whereas if you're talking about this small scale stuff, I mean, if, if that animal was unfit, Will wouldn't be wanting it, would he? The second thing is, all the stress is reduced by reducing the time. So if you've got the animal having a good life outside on a not intensive farm, transported briefly to a field outside the abattoir where again, it's in the kind of surroundings it's he or she's used to, this is going to be a much higher welfare life. It's the kind of end you or I would want if we were the animal. Mm. I'm just seeing in the chat here um, a woman called Jane Cooper, um, who's in Orkney, um, and she's saying that her Orkney abattoir closed January 2018, um, and they went uh, two and a half years and able to produce mutton for sale. Uh, they can do it now, but only by taking sheep a um, 110 mile journey. So, Phil, we can only imagine how appalling that is for the animals. Yes, that is, is, isn't that a shame? Um, you know, that, that's not how it ought to happen. 
animals on the Orkney should be killed on the Orkney, and and I, if, if their carcasses can then be sold anywhere, mm -hmm. okay. uh, can th I... this is so unnecessary. Yeah. And I, I I read Jane's point. I think Jane's wanted to come in. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'd uh, love to hear from you, Jane. Yeah. Um. The 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 reason it took two and a half years is because we had to sort out a cost that would for the meat that would enable us to transport them ourselves in the most high welfare way we could do. Mm. So we don't take any sheep that are unduly nervous. They are home slaughtered for home consumption. We, we take a group of up to 12 ourselves. Um, uh, they're established as a group. Um, I hate what we have to do. We have no other choice. We are farming the UK's rarest breed of sheep and if we don't carry on with what we're doing, that breed is facing extin extinction. So we, we, we're left with, so I, I, I'm happy with what we do in, in the sense that there is no other because when we, we get them there, we drive them slowly. The A9's a hellish road. We pay for the expensive ferry that's the shorter crossing and they're on the deck rather than in the bowels of the ferry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we unload them. They follow me happily into Lairidge. The well, the staff at the abattoir we use are superb and they rest overnight. And then the butcher who does the hanging and he is was very happy with the quality of the meat showing the animals weren't stressed. But we have to do all that and we can only do that for the enormous costs involved because we have a very high value product. But we shouldn't, they shouldn't have to do that. It used to be a 10 mile trip down the road. It, and every pig farmer bar one in Orkney has now sold up. Hmm. Um, it, it is killing rare breed farming in the highlands and islands that we have no abattoirs. But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I will argue for, with anyone that what we do with our sheep is acceptable but is not the standard I would want. Mm. But in the circumstances, I am happy because I know my sheep very, very well, that what we're doing is acceptable, but it should be better. I, th I think that's taking the responsibility all the way through. And that's the important thing. I mean, my organization, Compassion and Well Farming was founded by a farmer who prided himself on the fact that when his calves went to the local abattoir in Petersfield, he went with them. And that's the kind of personal effect you, you lose when you have to go for long journeys. You've made an exception because you're prepared to go to that extra trouble. But, but, the, but the local abattoir is making it possible for people to take the responsibility all the way through. You have two people at maximum uh, who, see, who see the animals through. It's got to be so much better to do things on a small scale and on a local scale. Yeah, and Jane, perhaps you can um, talk talk a bit further about how you might have been better supported for, for this situation not to have happened. Um, well, I mean, when our abattoir closed with no warning, and it was the council who did it because they'd been subsidising it. I mean, I spent the next year and a half campaigning. Government, council, you name it, I did it, and it all failed. Um, and it, it, it comes down to money. It's the cost of disposing of abattoir waste on an island because you have to ship it off and for the one day um, a week the abattoir operated to send the waste off was two and a half thousand pounds that's just the waste mm -hmm. so it, it, it was it was regulation um, it is abattoirs in the highlands and islands probably can't especially if they're part-time can't make a profit I argue they are essential infrastructure, which should be subsidized in the same way as schools, mm -hmm. because they are absolutely essential to life in the Highlands and Islands. If we want to get young crofting families back up here, they have got to be able to produce um, high welfare meat because we can't be growing exotic fruits and vegetables up here. It's livestock. So it, it really does require the government to say, okay, this is an essential service and we know we're going to have to um, support it financially. The value, the, the payback for local communities is actually far in excess of the money that's put in. It's just that money isn't going as cash to the abattoir. Mm -hmm. It's supporting the whole community. 
I mean, what, sorry, one ahead. of the argu one of the arguments that's used in favour of long distance transport and exporting animals, not only across, taking them across the country, but exporting them abroad is, of course, well, we've got to allow uh, transport of animals from Highland Islands to Scotland. Now, we would never have said that that couldn't be an exception. But, but the local abattoir answer is so much a better one. But I, I think Jane is completely right that this is something that's a priority, that if you want to produce stuff sustainably, high welfare, maintain communities and maintain the kind of culture that goes around. I mean, the, the stories that Will, Will takes, it's, it's part of the culture that you're building up. That is worth so much more than the, 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 the short-sighted cost-cutting that's gone in, in, in the closing of those abattoirs. Yes, and this this kind of lattice work has been dismantled, hasn't it, over the years? This kind of um, localized um, economy and supply chains have been dismantled. I mean, do you think there is a future where this can be rebuilt, or do you think it's gone forever? I don't see why it can't be rebuilt. I mean, we re rebuilt other things. So, for example, there used to be a really very small number of, of hen uh, egg farmers. You'd have a quarter of a million battery unit. In fact, some of them are now a million. But when they closed those factories down, they told me, well, when, when we close a unit with quarter of a million birds, we sign contracts with 20 small farmers to keep 12,000 each. Now it might be 32 or 64,000 now, but there has been a move back. It's still on too big a scale, but there's been a move back towards that kind of farming because Consumers and, and retailers, therefore, are requiring free range eggs. So you go in a smaller way. In the same way, if there's a move back towards trying to get kind of forms of farming, small, and then there will be a demand for it. And so I see no reason why you can't, but you have got to think, think in terms of the, the stories that Will is talking about. You've obviously, he knows how to sell his products. You need, you need that kind of skill as well as how, how to kindly run a, a, an abattoir and practically run an abattoir. But I, I do think that, that there remains the possibility to do more of that. There are more people wanting it. Um, the move to rare breeds and all of those kind of things that add value. It, may, it means that you have got far more jobs in the countryside, more money in the countryside, more culture in the countryside and happier animals. Um, can I just say, I've had to learn a lot more about abattoirs than most, most ordinary people. And one of the most undervalued skills in our society is the skill of the people looking after the livestock in Lairidge, the person doing the killing, and then the people doing the butchering. And I really feel we need these skills to be valued in our society, for these staff to be paid appropriately, and for it to be seen as a job that young people can go into because they take, can take pride in what they do if they do it well, and that their skills and their contribution to animal welfare are valued. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, you've, you've told me how you feel like you're the villain often and you're on the back foot and you're having to defend yourself. So actually quite the opposite of what Jane is encouraging. The thing is here is that it's a craft. That's the important thing here now. What we're talking about is a craft. That is someone that can handle or pick a lamb out of, if you like, pick 40 lambs out of 100 in a farm. Go from that farm, stop at a beef farm and pick four heifers from a group of 20. And then stop at a pig farm and pick six pigs from 25. Now that is a skill. That is something that you do not learn overnight. That takes years. And I'm still learning because there are new breeds of animals that are different to the touch, to the look. So even after 45 years, I'm still learning. But the important thing here is, is the craft of selecting the animal, transporting the animal, leraging the animal, Stunning, slaughtering it, dressing it, hanging it, cutting it, and selling it, and putting the money in the bank is something that's taken to bits. 
I mean, I was called in an abattoir up in Lancashire, William, you're one of the last of the Mohicans. And I didn't think I liked it because I felt, well, a chap with a tomahawk. That's what he was referring to. But what he was referring to was the skill of being able to do the job lot. And if we're not careful, we are going to lose this craft. And I'm afraid it'll never come back because there are people in offices that want to get rid of small abattoirs. End of. And they can be nicey, nicey, nicey to you in your face when you're in a meeting. And you know damn well that when I'm on the train five hours back from London, I get pains in my shoulders. Sometimes I think someone's got a little doll with a butcher's apron on and they're sticking pins in it. But, you know, these are, these are things that need to be addressed. For the first time in 30 years, we had a guy that was working for the agency. The best thing since sliced bread that's happened because he understood what we were doing. He understood that the public wanted what we were doing and he was doing his best to help us achieve. And unfortunately, the guy, he passed away in February of this year, just 50 years of age. And massive blow to me because it's a job to say that you can have a friend in the Food Standards Agency because they've got a Bible that they have to adhere to. And the regulator and the operator don't see eye to eye on most occasions. But this guy, I'm just, it's just a pity that he couldn't have lived a bit longer to see that the pandemic has actually delivered what we were wanting to achieve. And great shame, great shame that we lost a guy like that, that, that made me feel that I had a spring in my step. And more often than not, when you go to a meeting, you have to explain to people what you do. They should know what you do, but you take half an hour telling them what you do because they haven't done any research. Small abattoirs, nah, not essential. Yeah, let's move on. Let's talk about who we're going to play squash against tonight. Very difficult. And it's a long way to go to London, five hours on a train, for an hour and a half, two hour meeting, another five hours home. I think sometimes I'd have been better off staying at home and filling my tax return in. You, um, are you hopeful, Will, post-Brexit? Do you think this will make things easier or more difficult for, for local abattoirs? Well, you know, you, you, you're going to have a situation here that exports is the key word here. Mm. And if you go back to 2001 for the mouth and then we've had BSE, there hasn't been exports. Who's rescued the farming fraternity in the UK? It's the UK or the British housewife, house husband, whatever, to be politically correct. They are the ones that kept on buying the produce to keep a bottom in the market. And I just hope that that will occur again. And why can't we become self-sufficient in the meat that we eat? Why do we have to get stuff from Uruguay and Chile and New Zealand and Australia? Why? Because they buy aeroplanes off us, I suppose. But that's out of, out of my remit. Uh, I haven't got any room for any aeroplanes on my little farm. I mean, Rod Rodri, I know you didn't support us as leaving the EU, but now we have. Do you think this could be um, a good thing potentially for, for small farms? There's a question. Um, there's always potential, I suppose, but at, at this stage, as Will says, if we're gonna, if if we do potentially lose our export market, certainly for my type of farming where I've got small lambs, you know, and most farms around these parts are small hill lambs, so uh, the vast majority of our export goes to the EU. So if you slap a 40, 50 percent tariff on top of that, the export market is in trouble. So as Will says, there's potential maybe if. Um, consumer model shift and we've got an opportunity to sell more locally if if we put tariffs on imported meat then we've got a hope 
if, as has been talked about, there's no tariff on imports and we just have an open trade with the world, but there's tariffs on our exports to the EU, I think potentially we're in trouble. But there's always hope, I think, of changing, if you can con change, consume. There's a lot. One thing I do take sort of, just to bring that word up mentioned in the film, one thing the sort of solace I do take in the sort of vegan vegetarian movement is there's people there that care about where the food comes from and they want to make a difference and make the right decision. I personally think they're making the wrong decision for the right reasons. So I think if we need to be aware of where all our food comes from. So if we, if you can teach people, as Will says, to buy um, sustainably sourced meat as well as sustainable sourced plant-based food um, and know where it's coming from, there's always hope of tapping into the market. My concerns are just economies of scale because the UK is so, our temperate climate is so perfect for grazing livestock we at this stage produce more lamb we know we export more lamb meat um no we produce yeah so we, we our consumption of lamb meat isn't as um much as we grow uh, the other way around we, we're exporting a lot of meat but beef wise we're importing a lot from Ireland. so beef might i think a lot of people are thinking of moving into beef and dairy and are more concerned about the sheep meat market so i'm not hugely optimistic at the moment but i do think potentially I, with Will locally, I myself could potentially sell more lambs through Will and uh, hopefully keep doing what I'm doing. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. I don't think there's a point in there somewhere. Oh, you are. Well, put you on the spot. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you turned 60 this year, not so long ago. And as far as I'm aware, you don't have a successor in line so what what do you think will happen uh, to your area particularly and to the farmers like Rodri? Well you know I mean uh, I'm not going to go on forever the I mean I think I've done 40 years more than I should have done because the little man from the Ministry of Agriculture Fisheries and Food he would have liked to have put me in a crisp packet and thrown me in the sea but uh, that didn't happen but you know, what we've done is, is the story again. This, this is what people want, you know. I mean, one of the guys that, you know, these meetings that I go to in London, they're, they're so diverse. There are people, you know, selling flowers and what have you. And one of the guys came to tell me one day, uh, Will, I need to speak to you. I've uh, got a problem. Oh, what's the matter? He said, I'm... You're not going to like this, he said, but uh, the flowers that we usually cut, he said, uh, down in the southwest, we uh, couldn't get any staff. So last week, he said, uh, we got flowers in from Bolivia. It was cheaper. And he was upset about it. You know, so it's not just meat that we're talking about here. When someone wants lilies on the table, they've, got to, they've also got to think of, well, where do they come from? How have they come there? You know, and I was, I was quite taken by the guy. who has got nothing to do with farming or livestock or nothing, but he was upset that he'd gone against his morals because his business had to survive, you know? But we don't need to do that. We don't need to do this. You know, I mean, it, it, it's practical. This isn't rocket science. Animals born in a parish, an abattoir in the parish or the adjoining parish, and the customers in the parish or the adjoining parish. Why do we need to transport them halfway around the country? But there's someone somewhere thinks that, well, there's more money in it, isn't it? That's what it is. In Welsh, there's a saying, do with the gan, you will gain yog. And the uh, at the end of the song, you get the money. And that's what it boils down to. You know, I mean, uh, taking 10 lambs somewhere three times a month with diesel costs maybe escalating isn't worthwhile. Whereas they can take 80 to market or 80 to a big abattoir, one hit, job done. But again, when the big abattoirs close down due to foot to mouth and what have you, all of a sudden, Will Lloyd, well, I've got hundreds, if not thousands of friends that want to use my abattoir. But again, 
we've always had, and the lady from Orkney, I've, I've, I've just written this down. When the Red Meter package came out in 1979-80, there was a condition, i.e. livestock units, a thousand livestock units per small abattoir. And the unit allocation was as so. One beast, three pigs an unit, and five lambs an unit. Then the next line, and I quote, I can remember this, in a geographically remote place, livestock units will be doubled to help trade in that geographically remote area. Well, I would say Orkney is geographically remote, and I would also say, when you say Machanthath, it's nearly as long as Vladivostok. That would stipulate that it was remote, but it didn't wash. We had to take the thousand units. Now, hey ho, 2001 arrives. All the big places are closed for a month. No export. I think myself and Hugh from Tregaran, 40 miles, 40, 50 miles away, we were the first ones to get a license. I get a call from the Ministry of Agriculture. Hello, Mr. Williams. Uh, we were just wondering whether you'd like to get in line with the, the German Fleischmasters. What do you mean in line? I said, I thought we were on a level playing field. What goes on in Germany goes on in Machelkluff. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, the unit allocation now has changed. It's one beast, six pigs and 20 lambs. So when needs must, they can bend their regulations. And that was fact. That's not fiction. That's not a story. That's fact. I've still got the papers. And also when, when they want to be flexible, I think this is one of the problems is that when the word flexible is used by the ministry or the government officers, it's a capital F. But when I want to use the word flexible, it's a small f and it gets pushed to one side. There are flexibilities in the abattoir game, but nobody knows what they are. Nobody knows what to ask as a flexibility. I mean, my flexibility would be due to my experience in handling animals and meat, do I have to have a vet watching me for six hours? But that wouldn't be classed as a flexibility. So what are the flexibilities? Who, who deems, who, who says what a flexibility is? That could be a big, big part in abattoirs continuing for the next 20 or 30 years. You know, it's a risk factor. Yeah. If it's a high risk, right, you need someone there. If it's a low risk, why do you need someone there? It should be risk-based. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Phil, what are your thoughts on, on um, the CCTV um, being um, implemented across the board um, as, as an essential thing? Oh, sorry, you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, yes. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm supportive of CCTV. I do understand Will's attitude. I suspect most of us wouldn't like to be watched in our everyday, everyday work. Uh, I, I thought it was relevant to the question of the vet watching him, but actually the CCTV might be the alternative to that. Mm -hmm. It's web-based stuff, stuff that's online. For the small guy, that's the kind of, uh, you, you, there, there may be an opportunity there. I, I'm not going to go too far with that, with that way, but that, the CCTV is necessary because there are some people in abattoirs who are not so good. And when um, organisations have gone in and looked for footage, they have found a lot of bad practice. And the CCTV... It's two way. One is, one is it's a deterrent, but it's better if it's regarded as this is the way a, a, a abattoirs work. That you, you, you can you can show it's it's working well. I'm particularly thinking of the larger abattoirs and and the opportunity to actually measure the, the success of a job well done by looking at some of that footage. Yeah. Abattoir like transports is a place of very high risk for animal welfare. The person who does it well 
does an awful lot of good for animals because they save themselves a lot of suffering. The person who does it badly causes a very great deal of suffering. And the CCTV, if it is used right, is an important tool for improving it. So in principle, I'm in favor of it. Um, there will be people for whom it's not necessary. But how do you decide that in a fair and honest way in the first place? So I think it's right that it's there. It needs to be used in a positive way. So in the end, it's, it's not just a deterrent. It's, it's, it, it's used to, to check on work and say, yes, you've done that well. Um, but I, I think it's necessary. I can understand why if I was in Will's position, I probably wouldn't like it. Yeah, go ahead, Will. Cameras. I've got no problem, but I need someone to answer this for me, to make it easier for me to accept. When a calf is born on a farm to a young heifer, it might be a massive big calf, small opening, can't get it out. There's wrenches, there's ropes, there'll be a tractor. Not nice, not nice, but has to happen to get the calf from there, dead or alive. Luckily, what I'm talking about, he's alive. So he's on the farm, he suckles, fine. He then gets transported to market. There's no camera there. He arrives at the market. There's no camera in the market. He comes through the ring, I buy him. I ask the chap who owns him to drop him off at the abattoir. There's no camera at the market taking it to the abattoir. But once he comes to the abattoir, there's a camera on Will. Why is there a camera on Will? Why is there a camera on Will? Why, why, why are they picking on Will right at the end of the food chain? So if someone can answer that, I'd be really, really happy because on top of not getting the answer to that, there's an eight to nine thousand pound bill for putting cameras in and the vets there as well. Now, one thing I can't understand, I'm not a fan of modern technology, but you have to test and try, you have to. And I've asked, why can't I take my tablet on the arrival of animals into my abattoir? Why can't I take my tablet in and Skype the different pens with the animals and the water and the, the in the straw, to the vet? Because from what I can understand, there are NHS patients in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland that can't get a physiotherapist to them. So what they do, they send them a tablet and then they send them their exercises via Skype. So we can do this for humans that are potentially not well, but I'm not allowed to do it to fit and healthy animals that are going into the food chain because good chocolate makes good chocolate. If I'm going to dip in to something that's iffy, I'm going to lose my customers. I don't get up at five o'clock in the morning to lose customers. I get up to look after the customers because customer is king. You know, there's a sign in my shop. Our next customer is our next inspector. Remember that because if there weren't any customers, there wouldn't be any need for everybody all the way down to the vet. So I just want someone to be able to tell me why is it that at the end, Will the villain has got two or three cameras on him and it's nowhere else. I'm not advocating that they have them on farms, not at all, but I just want someone to tell me why have I got Big Brother watching me at the end of it? It's a good question. I mean, I think I think there will there will be cameras in some of these other places, and I think sometimes that will be a good thing. It will the cameras will become part of the process where um, stuff gets assessed and certified. But you're you're right. <laughs> That 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 you do you, that, that the, the the case that is come is come with you out, out of a need for that. There is a similar need in transport. I would like to see 
very large scale intensive farms. I would like to see them checked on, on, on these kinds of cameras and that would be quite good um, for ensure, ensuring good welfare and all of these things. Um, but you, you make a good point about the vet and the physiotherapist and all of that. We have um, Tracy and um, Alistair Keneal um, of the Farms Not Factories campaign on, uh, on the session tonight, which is great. And uh, I wanted, um, Phil, for you to, to speak to, um, before we open it up to the, to the Q&A, um, about the factory farming model and the link between zoonotic disease and the role that the local abattoir plays in, um, you know, protecting small farms and that being able to, to continue. So, sorry again, was that that one? I, I, so, so, so for the the co, I'm slightly confused by the question. Sorry, it's sorry. Um, the second part is not really a question, but um, understanding the link between factory farming and zoonotic diseases. Yes, yes. Well, well, there's an important link that, that a lot of the a, a lot of diseases have come from contacts with animals, and a lot from bad contacts with animals. We strongly suspect that the wet markets in China may have been responsible for COVID. But factory farms have been, we suspect, responsible for a number of outbreaks of high path flu, for example, that, a, that it, where you have a lot of highly intensive animals in, in, in a shed, uh, where the number is large, where the crowding is high, where they're stressed because they're growing faster than they ought to, you have the ideal conditions for viruses to spread and to mutate. And you haven't got the conditions in which the odd dead one uh, is, is, is not going to pass the virus on. So those are the conditions in which a low path flu, which might have entered the shed, uh, however, converts into a high path, highly pathogenic flu. And it's one of the ways in which factory farming is risky. Another one is the greater use of antibiotics. Those fast growing chickens are more likely to need antibiotics. The Dutch went down the route of requiring slower growing chickens in their abattoirs. Animal protection groups had a big campaign in the Netherlands where they showed this massively growing chicken, the cloth kit, the exploding chicken. Um, and, and they've all gone now for slow growing chickens. So the Dutch now grow slow growing chickens for their own market. That's 40% of the industry and 60% grow chickens for the rest of us. We import from the Netherlands. Um, and their slow growing ones need less than a third of the anti less than a third as likely to need antibiotic treatments as the fast growing ones. And why is that? Because they're growing at a natural, a more natural, um, healthy rate. Um, and, and where there's tantalizing interesting evidence, you could halve that risk again. Uh, where they've got the deer and Bisherming, that's their equivalent to the RSPCA ones. It looks like it's one in twenty where they have even more space. Uh, and, and slower growing chick, even more slower growing chickens. And, and so there's an example with antibiotics. So if we use less antibiotics in the farms, we're less likely to get antibiotic resistance. So factory farming is a health issue. We all know it's an animal welfare issue because we're overcrowding animals, we're growing them too fast, uh, etc. It's an environment issue, we've got to get rid of all that waste. They're all eating cereal grains we ought to be feeding to people that require lots of pesticides used, which you wouldn't need if you were growing a few cattle on grass, which can be grown sustainably in a much better way. So there's all sorts of stuff like health and environment and animal welfare that could be so much better if we did exactly what Will said earlier, which is to eat less but higher quality meat, like, for example, from a locally grass fed animal. When did you last hear of somebody using insecticides on the grassland? You don't. And so, and the grass helps to make rotation, makes it easier not to use insecticides on the crops you grow in between. Uh, and it's easier to grow without fertilizers and without nutrient runoff and all sorts of stuff like that. So if we can go back to that, it's good for the environment and health and people and animals and all of it. Thank you, Phil. And um, Rodri, could you just briefly give us your perspective? I, mean, I don't know if you're um, at a stage where you're able to, to talk about it, um, but <clears throat> I know you're shifting to regenerative agricultural practices. Could you, could you speak to that briefly? Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge shift because as I say, a lot of the farm, we've been organic, so my parents went organic before I came back in 99. And um, there's already quite a 
an array of uh, habitats on the farm and um, we've planted a lot of trees and we've created a lot of different sort of areas so the uh, certainly uh, yeah and no, I've been reading a lot about the regenerative agriculture movement at the moment and essentially it's more about caring for soils so yeah I'm looking at doing more mob grazing sort of smaller paddocks and shifting things around a bit more and um, yeah hopefully getting more Diversity in the soil and diversity in the invertebrates, which feeds the higher up the uh, the food chain. So, yeah, it's quite interesting that a lot of um, it seems a lot of the arable farms um, going down. This it's quite interesting that a lot more people seem to be using livestock now to help manage their soil. So you see a lot of systems where historically it was just arable, using lots of chemicals, lots of fertilizers, and now people are realizing that by getting uh, livestock animals back into the rotation and back into the system um, you can improve the soils in a far more effective way um, so again it's sort of quite ironic um, that livestock animals having been at times vilified because of um, climate change or biodiversity decline are actually it's being recognized more and more that they are the answer in many ways to both carbon sequestration, locking up carbon because of what they can do on, on rotations with, within arable systems, and also uh, for biodiversity because, you know, if you go back centuries and millennia, all our countries had large herds of grazing ruminants, so if you can, um, and, and they managed ecosystems. So if you can mirror that, then actually you can get the best of both. You get a really high quality product in meat and wool, um, as well as um, really good habitat and biodiversity on farms. So that's sort of the route. We're already on that journey, I think. And so it's just um, doing more research and, and hoping to, uh, yeah, try a few new things on farm. Great, thanks a lot, Rodri, for sharing your journey with that. Um, and I want to now open it out because we've got lots of uh, really interesting people on the uh, on the call. Um, so, Nina, I don't know how, how you want us to manage it, but um, I, I can kind of start from uh, Bill Grayson, maybe. You've um, you've posed a few questions. If, if you're up for unmuting yourself and um, starting from uh, from what you want to ask. Uh, yeah, um, thanks. Uh, just um, this question that um, I asked was about the, the EU regulations and um, Will implied, and probably more than implied, said that, that the worst of the um, regulatory burden came in with with the EU. And so, what I was wondering is, once we left the EU, is there more scope for easing that burden? Well, we. We, we all live in hope there, but at the moment, uh, when the vote was taken in 2016, I think my first uh, port of call was the FSA to ask, well, look, if this is the case, uh, we'll only need European rules for export abattoirs. The home market, we will, uh, we'll do our own rules and we'll be able to cope with what we want. Uh, 15 love to Will Lloyd the Butcher, I thought. But uh, within two or three months, we had a document to say until Brexit, we were continuing with the European rules and the new model would be based on the European rules. So I don't know where we're going. I can't see it getting any easier for us. Uh, I think what would happen is that if we're not changing our European laws as regards small abattoirs, what was the point of voting to go out? I can't get the answer to that with my camera question either. So, What, 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 what would you like to see, Will, in terms of um, support and, and um, input from the rest of the food chain, the, the, the farmers um, and, and small scale retailers. What, how, how do you think 
people that I, I, would come together to, to lend it, weight to this argument? It's a massive big picture because in the arbitrage game, when you have an orange and you cut the orange into four quarters, you have four pieces. In the arbitrage, we've always had the fifth quarter. And the fifth quarter used to be the price of the hides and skins and the, well, the rubbish. I mean, I can remember that in the 60s, they would come to pick the rubbish up and they would pay something like 50 or 60 pounds for the rubbish. Uh, my father always used to call that baco money. That's what he used to call that. Uh, the skins were worth five pound. The hides were worth 30 pounds. We've gone since then on BSC and everything that the rubbish now costs me 400, 500 pound every time we slaughter. The hides we get nothing for and we have to pay money to get rid of the lambskins like the farmers with wool. So that has gone out to the equation to help pay some of the costs. And that means then people say, well, how do you survive, Will? Well, I survive because I do everything. I do everything that I possibly can without having to pay someone to make sure that we can keep running. We do make money and it's not a crime to make money. I quite often say that if, uh, if I was in America, they'd make me a senator. But it's not a crime to make money. It isn't. Uh, but if we're on a level playing field, we get a chance to make money. And the upsetting thing about this is, is that since I've been running our place for 40 years, I've been to Europe quite a few times. And I must say that some of the meat operations that I've seen there have not been a th as third as good as what we are in cleanliness and the way the operations handled. And of course, thus comes the level or uneven playing field that we're on. But what needs to happen first is, is forget about giving grants and what have you, make sure that the way that it's been done is not over-regulated. It needs to be on a risk base, which will take a lot of costs out. And those costs that would be spent on inspectors and cameras could be utilised in making the place more animal friendly, if you like. Bigger fridges so that they could kill uh, not so often, but they could store it. You know, I mean, beef, since we've built the big fridge in the abattoir, I can hang beef now for five, six, seven weeks. And it makes a massive difference. It's massive. You know, you get a young housewife put it on Facebook. Wow, bought a piece of beef in Will Lloyd's today. Wasn't overly expensive. Wow, absolutely brilliant. Even the kids ate it. I just, I wanted to reply. My wife stopped me. Where have you been for the last 38 years? I've been doing it for 38 years. Where have you been? But people are starting to wake up to the fact that big isn't better. Small is beautiful. I always say that because I'm not very big. <laughs> Because I, 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 made, I made the point in the chat about the use of risk assessment in farm inspections. So the principle is, is already enshrined lower down the, the, the food chain. So there shouldn't be that much difficulty in, in asking for it to be applied when it comes to slaughter. I mean, again, um, at the arbitrage in the moment, at the moment, why use one piece of paper when 10 will do? That's the culture that I'm in at the moment. And it doesn't matter how much risk based or computer uh, electronic uh, movements we do, I still end up with a box full of paper at the end of a kill. And I get a bit upset because there's lots of these bodies that come to our abattoir, beef labeling, protected geographical indicator, um, the 
people that do the water testing, the effluent. These people, instead of all coming on the same day, one of them could come a year and share the information that they collect on that day with other people. That would make it easier for a start. I did have one old farmer one day. We were, we were slaughtering one day and there was uh, seven cars in the abattoir yard. And he said, what's going on here? Oh, I said, there's an audit. Then there's a cutting plant audit. Then there's someone looking at the effluent, someone looking at PGI. And his answer was, well, why can't they come in a minibus? It would be cheaper which was very basic, but of course, they were from the four corners of Wales. And when they're getting 45 pence a mile, it's a uh, hey-ho, lovely gravy train. Did you have anything um, further to add to that, Bill? <clears throat> Has that answered your question? Uh, yes, yes, it, it's, um, it's a rather bleak picture, but um, it's, it's, it's important to to know these things uh, just just finally i suppose there there ought to be an association for small abattoir owners to come together and 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 lend weight to their individual voices is, is, is there such a such a thing national craft butchers and i'm the policy director so there we are <laughs> the man with the stripes on his coat so, so how, how many of you are there coming together? Well, we, it's very difficult to have meetings because people are working, you know. Uh, yeah. But I've got to say the pandemic has, uh, has made it easier for us to meet on Zoom. And uh, it's, it's been really heartening for me to see a lot of the older guys wanting to have another meeting in three weeks. Been really, really encouraging. People wishing to share... Um, share their business views and look at other people to see their model, if they can improve. And of course, I think it's a, it's a fact that butchers like speaking to butchers, slaughterers like speaking to slaughterers. They don't want someone coming from the meat marketing board in a suit to tell them how they should be running the business. Because that's what happens mostly. You know, I mean, uh, I did have to tell one guy, you know, how do you think I've managed to run my business without a chap like you in a suit before? You know, we, uh, you know, we pay levies. Rodri pays them, I pay them. For what are we paying them? You know, I mean, part of that levy, why not say to the small abattoirs, forget paying levies. You're on a home market. You shouldn't have to pay them. You're doing a service to the country. But nobody's going to take that step, are they? That would save money, and that money could be then reinvested in the plant to make it better for the animals and the people. Hmm. Yeah, thank, thanks, Rob. Um, I see um, MP um, had a few questions. Um, if you wanted to unmute and, uh, and pose those to our panelists, and feel free. No. I think he's going to come. He's just got some problems unmuting. Oh, MP does. Okay. No problem. Um, who else have we got? Um, I see there's a lot of, um, well, several farmers on the call. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from some of them about their experience. Maybe, maybe Neil um, and Hilltop Farm Girl um, who farm... Um, Belted Galloway cattle, um, Swaledale and Wensleydale sheep on an upland farm in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, if you'd be interested in um, sharing your experience, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, yeah, hiya, and hi to all the contributors doing a great job. Um, I'd, we're reasonably lucky uh, in that we've got quite a few abattoirs around us. We're, um, we've actually got a really small abattoir, which is probably our nearest one. Um, and we really like using that abattoir because we, from an animal welfare perspective, um, you, you drop the animals off and you kind of know that the animals are going to be dead before you've even got out of the, the yard, to be honest with you. And that's, that's what we want to 
that's how we want to treat our animals, you know, on the last day, basically. Um, but I've, I've just put a question in the chat and probably directed at Will mainly. Um, it seems to me that the thing that makes small abattoirs less competitive is the, and what from what Will's saying, it's about the legislation and rules and regulations that he's having to adhere to. And when you take all those into account with the throughput, um, then that's a higher cost per animal of throughput, obviously. So, so we can potentially relax those regulations and do what Will's saying, which means he has less of those men in suits coming into his yard. But does that mean that we then can't make the claims that we currently claim as an industry that we have some of the highest welfare standards in the world? And that makes me slightly nervous. I'm not a big, I don't like big abattoirs whatsoever, but... A, I like to make those claims as an industry, as a farmer, and um, uh, there was a last point I was just going to make. So, yeah, you, you know, are we compromising animal welfare generally by not having those regulations in place? And, and just to finish, I'd be more than happy to have cameras all over our farm, to be honest with you, but uh, that's just another point. Well, I think we're one of the best countries in Europe, if not the world, for animal welfare. Yeah. Uh, and, and the practices that we have in farming. And we have so many certificates. You know, I mean, how many hoops do I have to jump through to demonstrate that I sell local lamb that's come from four miles away but to get it with a protected geographical indicator status, the hoops I have to jump through. Now, this is just an example. The farmer will get a visit just on the spot visit to check his medicine records and everything, movement records. They'll come to me. They'll go through my whole HACCP, my whole plant, my cutting plant and all the movements and claims I've made. And yet, if a hotel or a restaurant buys a piece of beef that's six kilos, he can serve 96 people on a Sunday. Before the pandemic, this is, remember now, before somebody picks me up on it. Because he's got a piece of paper to say that he's had a piece of beef from Williams but he's bought another five or six from frozen food, from bookers, from all over the place. Yeah, Who's, checking that? Who's checking that? Yeah, yeah, and fair point. The problem we get then is if someone of those 96 have a bad piece of beef, they're over in my shop telling me that beef I had in hotel wasn't very good, you know. Maybe it wasn't off mine. But this is why I have got a beef with things like this. These are things, protected geographical in indicator is a good thing, but it needs to go all the way, not halfway, all the way. And it's not but, going all the way. But just to come back on that though, if that would mean more legislation in place in some areas of the food chain, which, which probably isn't a bad thing, but then you're adding more legislation, more regulations to the hotel industry. And, and so, they would have more, you would have less potentially, but you know, you haven't really gained anything. I, I completely get what you're saying, but it's what have we achieved? Well, can I just give an example now? You know, everybody's on about price. When you're dealing with caterers, it's price. Get a guy in a couple of weeks ago, I need a price for sirloin steaks. So I, I bit, I bit really hard. I, I don't usually, but I did. I said, listen here. There was one of your staff last Saturday knocking my window at 20 past six in the morning. Have you got any bacon? I've got 20 people to make breakfast for, no bacon. Now she would have paid 60 pound a kilo for the bacon because she had to get breakfast. So why is it when it suits that they can pay for it and then other times they just want to rip people off? And that goes down then to, to, to legislation again. We can't do any more. The farmer, the abattoir and the butcher, we can't do any more paperwork for PGI. We can't. It's not possible to do more paperwork. But if there's a false claim being made in an eating place, 
I don't think that's fair. I, I don't think it's fair either. But uh, on the converse of that, if we decrease, decrease our regulations within this country, then does that compromise our ability to say that we have the highest welfare standards in the world? Before we joined the EU, how many people died of E. coli from small abattoirs? Don't know. No. Well, there couldn't be that many or we'd have known about it, wouldn't we? Well, I, yeah, I don't know the answers to that, but that doesn't answer the question about whether it compromises our animal welfare standards or not by reducing regulations. That's, that's the point I'm getting at, really. Nobody wants to see us having less regulation where it's needed. But why do I have to have a vet watching me when they do a Skype exercise for people that they're doing up in the Isle of Skye and what have you, for the physiotherapy. Why can't we embrace modern technology? Yeah, I absolutely agree. We should be able to. Well, that would concur with more of a saving again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean the vet's been there 100% of the time. Never seems to make a great deal of sense, but, but at the same time, it does need monitoring in some way and yeah you can add, you can use your technology to do that and and you can use that technology on farms as well well you'd, you'd be allowed to, why not follow it all the way through when yeah, the farmer yeah. loading them onto the trailer take a picture of it yeah absolutely yeah yeah video it you know what, yeah, what, yeah. what's the big deal what's the big yeah. deal but it's just this problem of i just feel as i said in the film that i always have to prove my innocence and yeah, i yeah. I don't get up at five o'clock in the morning to, to, to think, well, when I'm walking over to the abattoir, oh, well, what are they going to find today? What are they going to pick on today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not the way to go and do a week's work. No, no. And it's the same in farm inspections as well, to be honest with you, Will, but it's, yeah. I know, I but, have them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers, Will. Thanks. Hagi. Let me just go to it quickly, Alex, just to say, I think... Yeah, of course. Two things that Will and Neil are talking about. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that you can have both. I think you can. We can maintain our high animal welfare standards, and but what Will's asking for is actual help, be it financial or actual practical help. So if he needs to have a vet in his small abattoir, he, sh he need the, the small abattoirs of such local importance, both socially and economically, to the rural community. He needs if he has to have it, he needs financial help to pay for that, or if he needs someone else to carry out paperwork for him, he needs, he shouldn't have to put all these extra burdens on top of him. Mm -hmm. I told you, Neil, I think we need to maintain our high um, animal welfare and that's something that I feel very strongly about, but I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. And I think what Will's asking for is a, a fair playing field and just be it financial help or practical help in ensuring we maintain standards, but he isn't um, putting his hair out and to tick all these boxes and can actually get back to the craftsmanship of what he does best, which is butchering, butchering meat. Yeah, 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 fair point. Yeah, and um, Will, could you clear up for us? Um, Bill Grayson asked, is it true that the abattoir owner has to pay for the vet's time? Well, the, the, the vet's time is paid for, but this is, at the moment, we're, uh, we're on a clawback. We get uh, on a percentage, which is great, but what will happen what will happen is we've paid them before actual time costs uh, and we're grateful for the lobbying that, you know, lots of people have done that we're on this percentage, but the time will come again that they will say, right, okay, we'll charge actual time costs. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like, you know, you, 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 we'll talk about rare breeds. Rare breeds, indigenous breeds, those cattle, to me, I'm old fashioned, they need to have four, if not six teeth, the old cattle, they need to have done three winters out, that's your proper beef. But of course, if they're over 36 months now, if they're a day over 36 months, oh, there's different rules and regulations. Now, it means that I cannot remove the vertebral column from a beef unless there's a vet watching me. Well, that's impairing on my business because 
Say, for example, you had taken three over 30 month cattle, which I don't do anymore because what happened when I phoned the vet to say, well, look, we've been busy. I need a side of beef and I can't because the next one isn't over 30 months. I can't come till Monday. So I've got a fridge with four cattle in there that are over 30 months and I'm refusing people in the shop beef because you imagine how I feel. Little man walking on the ceiling, you know? Now, surely there needs to be some slack cut here, i.e., let's make it 36 months. Because anybody that keeps beef more than 36 months, really, they're not viable. They need to be turned into money. Surely you agree with me with that, yeah? So that's one rule that could change because it's embarrassing, Alex, for the vet to have to stand there and watch a craftsman remove the backbone from a sirloin and a rib of beef because the law says that he's got to, mm. because of BSE. And that interrupts business. What other business would put up with that? You know, so where they're helping on costs, there's still other costs there and rules that would really, if they were tweaked, help us. Mm. Thank you, Will. Yeah. And um, we're, we're now reaching um, 9 p.m. And um, I don't know if um, MP um, was able to, to unmute and, uh, and put forward a question, but we are at, um, at the time and I'm conscious I don't want to keep anybody. Um, so we can round it up here or if MP you want to No, he's saying, OK. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, yeah, I think that's uh, we'll leave it there then. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for our panelists, for Will Lloyd and Phil and Rodri and um, for everybody else who participated. Um, it is a, a, a bleak situation potentially, but there does seem to be um, a shift in um, people's relationship to food. And hopefully that might have some impact on um, on valuing businesses like Will's and Rodri's. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for everyone attending. And thank you so much, Alex, for this great session and facilitating it so well. It was really interesting. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Thanks, all. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you very much. Yes. Cheers, William. Um, will the people be going on YouTube? Yeah, Jane, I can um, put the uh, link, the Vimeo link right now onto the chat. That's brilliant, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I also put a link in for um, the Sustainable um, Food Trust have um, a campaign for local abattoirs, which has um, a wealth of information about um, local abattoirs. I also put that in the chat, but I'll put it in here again um, in case you missed it. And just to remind everybody that the, the recording of the session, including the chat, um, will be made available online. I think on the conference website, I'm sure we'll get informed exactly how. <laughs> all right, thanks all and have a great rest of your evening. Good, good night, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.